I'm Nancy Gurdon. I'm the Executive Director of ODU, Strom Entrepreneurial Center and Entrepreneurship Initiatives. And I happen to be an entrepreneur myself, so I am really excited to be here today. This panel, we're here for one purpose, and that's really to share with you some information and tips and resources available to you as you establish and grow your enterprises. Before we get started, though, I'd like to welcome to the stage two leaders in our community for their welcome as well. The first person is Dan Peterson. He's the market president for Southside Commercial with BB&T Bank. He's treasurer for the GNC Greater Norfolk Corporation and also co-chair of the Norfolk Technology Corridor. And the second individual is Dr. Chip Filer. He's the associate vice president for entrepreneurship and economic development and my colleague at Old Dominion. So let's welcome Dan and Chip. I don't even know who that young guy is up there. Goodness <laughs> gracious. Well, thank you all very much for your time. Uh, I know it's 4.30 on a Friday, and I really appreciate everyone being here. Before I get started, I just want to make sure everyone recognizes the power, the power of the individuals that we have in this room. And what I mean by that, and this has been statistically proven, that when you get really smart individuals and you put them together within close proximity of each other, ideas generate innovation occurs, business plans develop, and new businesses are started. And this is what we're trying to do, and this is what we're actually implementing as we speak right now with the Norfolk Technology Corridor. So what's occurred? What has changed? Last year, the fastest high-speed wire landed in Virginia Beach, the fastest in the United States. I'm going to say that again, the fastest in the United States. This is, on the low end, this is 20 times faster than anything that you have with Cox or Verizon. On the high end, this is 90 times faster than anything out there. Since then, the cities, and this is the, I've been in Hampton Roads for 15 years. This is the first time the South Side cities have all come together and started to collaborate. These are city council members. These are mayors, these are business leaders. They're coming together because they see that this is the future and this is a key strategic objective that we have, but we've only got a limited window. And I'd say that window is probably three to five years because technology moves at breakneck speed. So we've now taken that high-speed wire and the city of Norfolk has already uh, laid the groundwork for that wire, for this technology corridor. And when I say technology corridor, for the purposes of our discussion, think from Norfolk State to the downtown Norfolk, Granby, Greater Granby Street area to ODU. And what we're focused on is trying to build population density within this Granby Street corridor through businesses, through our, uh, our nonprofit organizations, through our hospitals, and most importantly through our universities, and getting these individuals to start to collaborate together. So what is some of the progress that we've made at GNC as it relates to this initiative? Currently right now we've got a memo of understanding sitting on the, uh, the city's desk waiting to be inked, and that should be any day now, which defines the partnership where Greater Norfolk Corp, which is made up of a number of business leaders downtown, will partner with the city strategically to try and market and gain momentum on this initiative. Norfolk State and ODU have also announced plans to open up uh, new technology satellite labs right downtown. We've already got some great momentum with, with businesses such as Grow, businesses such as Extuple, businesses such as uh, Trade Team Interactive, and many others that I'm not mentioning. We've also got the Elizabeth River Trail. And what's important about that, we're not recreating the model, we're just copying the model of other cities where this has been successful. Cities like Denver, cities like Raleigh-Durham, cities like Chattanooga, cities like uh, Austin, Texas. One thing that they found is important is that you have some sort of green space. And our green space is the best of any of these locations, and it's right on the water. 
Five years ago, the Elizabeth River Trail didn't even exist. Within the last three years, uh, through the leadership of Chuck McPhillips, GNC's raised a couple million dollars to build this entire trail. We've got an executive director. It is a reality now. And this is important. I've been working with businesses for 15 years here in Hampton Roads. The number one complaint, the number one complaint every single time, year in and year out, is the ability to be able to find and retain qualified labor. The number one complaint. The youth and higher paying jobs, this is what, these are the type of um, things, this Elizabeth River Trail, this is what they want in their environment. <coughs> In addition to that, we continue to focus on collaborating and we're spreading the word. And what's m been most eye-opening through my leadership, we've had about eight different meetings with, uh, with leaders from all the different groups, the universities, the, the, the hospitals, the business leaders, and what's been most eye-opening is everybody's been moving forward in different directions. And everybody's been making progress towards this initiative we just haven't taken the time to talk with each other and collaborate and see when we gain together, when we come together, one plus one starts to equal five. Five plus five starts to equal 100. And this is the momentum that we're working on. This event right here, this is part of that momentum. And this is part of the business model that these other cities have had and been very successful in developing new uh, technologically focused jobs with, with higher income wages, which ultimately helps the, the global community at hand. So in closing, I'll ask for one humble request from all of you. Spread the word. Let's get some energy going here. Promote it. Talk to your city officials. Talk to your business leaders. Let them know this is the future. We need to capture this high-speed fiber. DC is already running wire down to Hampton Roads to take advantage of it. And so our window of opportunity is very, very limited because this is a key differentiator that differentiates ourselves from anywhere else in the U.S. If you hear people talking about, oh, well, that's, that's never going to work or, or that's, that's, that's hoopla, they're either not being visionary and looking towards the future or they're scared of change. And I encourage you to not let them get away from that. I encourage you to take some time and talk with them and explain to them why this is important and why this has to be a success. So thank you very much, and I'll go ahead and turn over the mic to uh, Chip. Thanks, Dan. So welcome, everybody. Uh, glad to see everybody here this afternoon. Uh, make no mistake about it, what we're all trying to do here is hard, right? This isn't easy. Uh, as humans, we tend to want to control everything, and innovation is necessarily out of our control, largely. What we do know is that innovation has some certain ingredients that are helping to facilitate innovation uh, and help to create businesses going forward. There's no magic button that we can push or no magic lever that we can pull the best thing we can do is create a really conducive environment and a culture of innovation. And I think that's part of what the effort here for IE on Granby is. These types of locations exist throughout the country. In fact, Brookings Institute has been doing a lot of research over the last 10 years on what they're referring to as innovation districts. Um, and many of them you've heard of. Uh, they're the usual suspects. Silicon Valley, Boston, the Research Triangle, Austin. But others aren't as obvious. And in fact, some of the other newer innovation districts that are highly successful, boy, they look a lot like we do. They're places like Pittsburgh. They're places like Nashville. Places like Cincinnati. So I would urge all of us in this room to think about, you know, how do we get that brand? How do we become that next, next brand? And I would submit to you that these districts are largely successful because they have the ingredients in place. And then a lot of times they just, people get out of the way and let the magic serendipity start to happen. So what Brookings refers to as the magic ingredients are that you combine anchor level research universities, high growth firms, and creative startups in a well-designed amenity rich environment. 
So notice there, that's very important because it's combining a sense of people, a sense of physical aspect to this, that you need designs to the innovative workspace, and also a sense of amenities and wrapping around not just working, but living and playing. So I would submit to you this, look around. I mean, this is exactly what's already happening here in Hampton Roads. If you think about some of the recent events that you've read about in the newspaper over the last, say, two or three weeks, we have the opening of the NSU Innovation Center, an anchor research institution right in downtown Norfolk. We have the, the announcement of what will be known as assembly, driven largely by one of our high growth firms in Hampton Roads, Grow. And then, which you haven't necessarily heard about yet, but I think it's the worst kept secret downtown, <laughs> is ODU will be opening an innovation center, another one to match our Bush Street Center uh, on Bank Street in August, another anchor research institution. Add to that all of these new existing resources, many of which you're gonna hear about because the folks are on the stage, with 757 Angels, 757 Accelerate, Start Wheel, not to mention TCC, not to mention the ODU Bush Street location, which I've already talked about, companies like Extuple. Folks, I would urge you to think that we're not here today to figure out how to create an innovation district in Norfolk. We have it. What we're here to do now is figure out how we take it to the next level and create a global brand. So on behalf of the university, all of its faculty and staff, and our students, whom we hope that you employ at some point in time, we thank you for your hard work on this issue. We urge you to reach out to us if we can ever be of assistance, and we wish us all the very best as we try to move this thing to the global brand that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think those messages are extremely important to really set up our discussion here uh, because a lot of what we're going to talk about in our panel really relates to the value of collaboration, um, being a partner here in the region, and also the role that really all of us who want to not only start a company but scale it up will, will play in terms of the region. So with that, I'd like to actually turn to our panel. Uh, we have an amazing group of people. And I did a little math. It's going on 200 years of experience sitting up here. I'm not going to say who's got what. Uh, but again, bear in mind, entrepreneurship is exponential in terms of, of experience, uh, certainly far more than, than, than the dog years we all know about. So what I would like to do is I'm going to ask each of our panelists to take one moment and give them a, a little bit of a sentence about their group and what difference do they make for an entrepreneur. And I'm going to stop with Bob, if you don't mind. I'm Bob Smith. Hi. Uh, I run a program called the Innovation Commercialization Assistance Program, or ICAP, and it's a statewide program, and what we do is we work with uh, early stage companies, anywhere from I got an idea to maybe you're making your first sale. And uh, what we try to do is help them develop um, a business model uh, that they validate in the marketplace, and in addition to that, we uh, help them to think about their go-to-market strategy. How can they do the most with the least amount of money? And uh, we work with partners like everybody here on the stage. But, um, I just came from one, which is why I'm kind of a little bit discombobulated. I just came from Harrisonburg, and, um, and I'm still trying to figure out where I'm at. <laughs> but uh, glad to be here. Happy to talk. So yeah, I'm Marty Kazabowski. I actually work for, for CHIP and with Nancy at what we now call the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Old Dominion University. Um, we like to say we've got a big university, and we're not afraid to use it. What we mean by that is wherever you are in your entrepreneurial journey, from ideas to something much uh, farther down the path, we can help with resources, with people, with advice, with some clients of ours who've been there. Uh, so that's, that's really what we do. We are here to help in a whole bunch of different ways, using the power of a university to make some of that stuff happen. So I'm Evans McMillian, and I am the executive director of 757 Accelerate, and we are um, the new kid in town, and we have done one cohort of a 12-week selective mentor-driven acceleration program, and we really are entrepreneur fir first and focused on connecting entrepreneurs at the stage where they have a product or sort of looking to try to establish product market fit. We'll get into that, I guess, in a minute, but um, we, we are focused on giving them capital, $20,000 of non-dilutive capital in a grant form, and connections, mentors, investors, and a lean startup education, and in a workspace that we provide, and then we're trying to help you connect with 
customers. So we have pitch days, demo days, and um, and we've done it one time, and, and we're looking to do it uh, repeat again this fall. Hi, good afternoon. My name's Monique Adams. I'm the executive director of 757 Angels, um, and I'm going to speak to you on behalf of 757 Seed Fund as well. So I'm going to do double duty here today. Um, I'm a, one of the co-managers of 757 Seed Fund. I'll start with the seed fund. It's really a pre-seed fund. It's a 1.5 million micro um, fund, which is a community-focused founders fund, which is designed to get pre-seed money, and at some point I'll just define what that really means um, for those of you that are interested. 757 Angels um, is a angel investor network, so our individual investors make in independent investment decisions. We've invested $43 million over the course of the last four years to 21 companies. We're currently running um, our 10th cycle of 757 Angels, so it's really exciting. Um, 757 Angels focuses on companies with validation. Um, perfect time to pass it to you. Uh, I'm Scott Tolleson. Uh, I'm a partner with a venture firm in Richmond uh, called uh, NRV. Uh, we invest a little later, but we come down and, you know, try to check on everything that's going on in this market. Uh, the companies we invest in usually are um, a little further along. We still consider them to be early stage, but, you know, they've picked a direction and they might be a, a local or a regional success, and we want to make them a, you know, a bigger national success and bring in more money and, uh, you know, executives that can help staff them out or uh, corporate partners or, or even, you know, bigger corporations that might eventually uh, buy them. And I, I just want to say, as a, the only carpetbagger coming down on this panel, that you know, it says something about your ecosystem that you've, uh, you know, been able to move these companies along down here well enough that, again, you got carpetbaggers like me showing up. So you'll probably <laughs> a year from now have ten. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> so, so that's actually a, a, maybe a good segue. Uh, you know, it's interesting to know that we have these resources in the in the region, but uh, the question is. How do I know if I'm starting up a company, or I have an idea, I have an invention, I have a social problem I want to solve, where do I start? And you know, we talk often about the fact that, that entrepreneurship is a journey, and it's a process. Um, it's a way of, of making things happen. So maybe to get a little insight, let, let's just use a hypothetical entrepreneur. We, we actually thought about using a real one, and we thought, no, we probably should pick a hypothetical. So let's assume it's me, or it's one of you, and you have an idea, you have an invention, you want to start. Where do I start here on the, on, the, on the process? What do I do to really get the most power out of moving my idea through? So, Bob, let's say, what would you say to that? How would you begin with an entrepreneur? Well, i, I tell you what we tell entrepreneurs. Nobody cares about your idea. What? <laughs> There's only one person that matters that cares about your idea, and it's your customer. And the mistake is to think, well, I have an idea, and then go out and build something, and then try to come to somebody like one of us and say, hey, give me this money, because I spent all my money building something, and now will you pay me to go figure out if there's a market? So we try to tell people, great, you've got to start with your idea, but the first thing you should really do is find out who your customer is. Mm -hmm. And there's only one way you can do that, that we, uh, that we teach anyway, and that we work with our partners to try to do, and that's go talk to people. If, uh, you know, I always tell people, if you don't wake up every morning, wanting to talk to your customers, you don't want to be in business. If you, don't, you know, if you don't want to understand everything about them and how to make them happy and how to make that one first customer happy with a less than perfect product for, an over, for, for too much price, you don't want to be in business. And so that's what we try to do is we try to say, hey, you know, before you go on this journey, make sure you're ready for it and make sure you know who you're trying to help. So what do you say if I say, well, yeah, I don't want to go talk to people yet. I don't want them to take my idea. <laughs> How do you respond to that? Me? Uh, I say, uh, one, you're going to find out from those people that it's not as good an idea as you think it is, and they're not going to steal it. But it's really not about that. It's not about the idea. It's about execution. It's about how do you wake up every single morning and talk to your customer. And I always say, you know, we hear from entrepreneurs a lot, well, this is a risky thing, or I got too much risk in my venture. And I talk about it's not about risk. It's about uncertainty. And every single day, you should be waking up trying to figure out how you can take uncertainty out of that process, whether it's customer knowledge or technology knowledge or market growth knowledge. Go out and figure out how to get uncertainty out of that. And then your idea, if it's good enough, will be something you can actually execute. 
I would just add to that. Um, a lot of people come to investors and want us to sign non-disclosure agreements, <laughs> NDAs. We don't sign NDAs. So for um, all of you out there, investors aren't looking to steal your idea. We're not looking to make the next iPhone or launch the next Uber. But we're really super excited about your idea. We're investing in founders that can execute their ideas. Um, we don't sign NDAs. If we sign an NDA, we would be out of compliance right away because we get 20 other deals that look a lot like yours um, very, very quickly. So just so you know, there's lots of articles on that. I don't know if you want to add to that. You know, you asked a question about um, who do you talk to first. And I did mm -hmm. want to, I, I have maybe a bit of a different opinion. Um, I think you should talk to everybody at the same time yeah. because um, like I know for me, for instance, um, you might not, uh, I, I don't like to invest in people unless I've known them for a year or two. And so if they come up to me really early, um, you know, when they're first meeting you guys, I, I love that. You know, I spent most of my career as an entrepreneur. And so I love to help them, not just out of the generosity of my heart, but if I've known them for, you know, two years and watched them kind of do their thing and stumble and fall and get back up, yeah. you know, I'm much more likely to invest. And I might even have tips, you know, so. I'll riff on that, too. Your coachability is a very important thing. You know, I think we'd all say that we look for people who listen to the advice, take it on board, maybe alter it for their own circumstances, but, but they're, they're coachable. And we love to see folks come back to us having made some progress based on a lot of advice that they got. It's, it's valuable stuff. Yes, we talk a lot about the entrepreneurial journey, and, and I'm hoping that that slide was up there, but that's just a a visual representation of where you might be in the idea stage and then talking to customers, getting customer feedback, getting a little validation, asking for some money to maybe get a little more validation. But what it really is is sort of a crawl, walk, run approach. This stuff doesn't happen overnight and, and a lot of people have great ideas and it's super uh, execution. Is, I mean, I think that's what everyone's saying is that it's really just about your execution and and business acumen and coachability and the willingness to listen to people who may not know whether or not your idea is perfect, but they sure know a lot about the space you want to grow in, which is this space, is the ecosystem, and you, you need a lot of people to lean in for you to make it happen. Nobody's idea is just so organically fantastic that they don't need input and engagement from the people around them. So, so maybe you could each also elaborate, again, back to the idea of I have an idea, I'm testing it with customers, Scott says I should come speak with them earlier. How, how do I think about fundraising? How do I find out about financing my idea? What are, what are some of the concepts I should think about early, at an early stage? Maybe each of you can do a quick update on that for us. Well, I think the finance people are over there, but I would definitely say, I mean, we're co-managing the seed fund together, but I, I would say that, at least from our perspective, we see people who are at the earlier stages, and again, we're in the group where everybody thinks they're early, but. Um, I would say these are companies that are looking to validate, and Monique has said, you know, the space they start to invest in, the angel stage is companies that have validated. There might be a company that's a seed fund prospect who has, needs a little bit money to, to validate their idea, but the resources that come all the way through this trajectory here, all the way through, you're going to get mentorship, and you're going to get people like Scott who spent some time with you for the, a year or two before you're at the stage where he's willing to really talk to you. So I would say the financing piece, I mean, one of my thoughts is you're going to need money to grow a scalable business. So it starts all along the way with gathering information and expertise from this group of people that knows what you need and just listen and take it on board. And then I think there are various stages that people are going to say loud and clear, I need to see a certain amount of validation or, you know, in the SBIR space, I need to have at least enough of a product that I can go out and market it to potential customers in the military. So um, that's sort of what the accelerator kind of fits in here in the middle to try to get you to the stage where you can, number one, show up with a pitch deck to, number two, understand what this group might be expecting from you, that you're not talking to funders that are so much further along than you are. So some of it is learning, like spending enough time to learn the vocabulary and the, and the steps along the journey to, to make your time well spent and theirs. A thing I'd add to that is I, I'm still convinced that the single best way to fund your company at the early stage is with an actual customer, somebody who will actually buy your stuff. Yeah. Imagine that. Uh, I always like to see people, too, have 
I know we live in sort of a post-business plan world, but I still like to see people have a plan. Something that says, here's where we're headed, here's how fast we're going to go down that path, and then here's roughly the kinds of money I need to have. And I think too often people will go to the far end of the, of the dais here and ask those questions without you know, working on some of the earlier stage stuff, in particular customers. Uh, Evans mentioned SBIR. If you're not familiar, there are a lot of programs, government programs that fund technology development. There are an increasing number of programs that fund customer discovery. I'd really look for some of those early stage things that are mostly non-dilutive to really, again, take uncertainty out of that process earlier rather than later. Um, but I, I'm going to go back to my customer-centric religion here a little bit about that, though. Uh, when you say plan, I want people to understand model versus plan. Yes, yeah. I, I don't want to see a 40-page business plan. I nobody, want to see, nobody I want wants to see that. a chart. I want to see. Yeah. I can't unremember some yeah. of the business plans I've read through. <laughs> but um, what's key is business model isn't as complex as it sounds. It's very hard to execute, but it's conceptually very easy. You first have to have a customer, not 9 million customers, not 60 different kinds of customers. You have to have a relatively good idea of a customer segment that you're going to enter the market to go and attack, especially if you're looking at small dollars amount. You can't attack 30. You can't attack 40. And if you do random sales across 20 or 30 different groups, that means nothing. So if you come, um, to Marty's point, if you can prove you can sell and repeat a sale at a very small scale, people like that. Beyond a customer, you have to have a value proposition. Um, what most people miss, and what I spend a lot of time in the programs we all put on together trying to train people to do, is to think about a value proposition, because everybody wants to say, hi, I'm company X, and we do Y, and isn't that great? Can I have money? And it doesn't matter what you do. It matters, can you, can, cre can you create value for that first customer? So unless there's a big, solid why the customer wants you to solve their problem, in other words, they get a very big benefit from it, then if you can put those two things together, you're probably most of the way toward a validated business model. But as long as the model gives you the five, the five things you need to do, in my mind, in order to go and actually seriously ask one of these folks for money. It doesn't mean you can ask them. Believe me, they see plenty of people that ask them for money. But I, there's five things I think you need to get the money. The first thing is that validated business model. The second one's a team. Execution is everything, so you fund the team, not the product, you fund the team. Third, you need what's called a minimum viable product. That doesn't mean the product for six years from now. It means the product for that one customer that finds one piece of value that you can do replications of sales. You need some sales traction. It doesn't have to be huge. right? You need to be able to prove to that one segment you can sell sometimes. And then the fifth one that I say is, is you need uh, some, some form of partnerships. You need some way that without their money, you can, st or when they give you small bits of money, you can get large amounts of scale for little bits of money. And if you get those five things, then you can start talking to people for money. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, I'm not sure who's out there um, in terms of what type of companies you all are looking to grow. Um, just to be clear, we're all very supportive of all kinds of entrepreneurship up here. Um, but in my world, um, at the 757 Seed Fund and at 757 Angels, we're focused on scalable companies. And what that means is we don't, look, we don't fund nonprofits. And what that also means is that um, we don't fund lifestyle businesses, although I'm very supportive of them and I wish everybody a tremendous amount of success. That's just not where our investment goes to. So I just wanted to establish that first. In terms of the Seed Fund, just to give a, 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 a little more um, color. Um, the seed fund is going to provide money for validation, so to help um, better establish product market fit. Just to give you some examples of what sort of use cases that would go to. Um, maybe you've established who your customer is, but you need to figure out CAC, which is customer acquisition costs. We're always going to ask for it. You might know. You might need to run a pilot to figure out CAC. Um, Maybe to figure out lifetime value of a customer. We love that ratio, um, lifetime value. Maybe you need to drive users. Maybe you're really looking to drive users. Maybe you need a pilot to drive users. Um, maybe you need to establish product market fit with a limited audience. So you're going to test this on two specific um, customers, and it will be an unpaid pilot, and you need money, actually, to run that pilot. And perhaps this is a use case where you might be looking to refine a product. Right, So you're beyond version one, you're looking to do version two, and you need some money to do that. 
um, and then go out and run a pilot on that to make sure that um, you're on to something. So that would be the 757 seed fund. 757 seed fund um, is early stage money, early, early, earlier. <laughs> um, this is earlier money, but this is not money for companies at ideation. You're beyond ideation and you're looking to validate. And with that validation, you become more attractive to later stage funders like 757 Angels. Real quick to sort of give you some color on 757 Angels. We'll do pre-revenue companies, assuming they have some validation. Um, and sometimes our companies have revenue, so I would say anywhere between zero and a million dollars. But revenues are like Christmas for me. Okay, so I get really excited when we have revenue comp revenues with our company. That's not always, that does not always mean that that company is investment worthy. Um, but again, just to give you a sense, 757 Angels, lots of traction, lots of validation, um, but you could be pre-revenue and demonstrate that maybe by navigating a, a, a hairy regulatory path and maybe getting some FDA approval. There's a number of ways to demonstrate traction um, for my group that is not necessarily revenues, which is different from you, for uh, your sweet spot. Yeah, kind of. I mean, the stuff that we see is usually kind of found first gear, I guess you'd say. Um, but I mean, going back to the idea of fundraising, uh, I think it's a very I, I did one company on the West Coast and then did one back here. So a very different vibe for what, what fundraising is. Um, don't look at it as a discrete thing that you have to do. Fundraising is more part of building your team. Uh, if, you, if you have an idea for, I don't know, a software app or whatever, uh, and you think, okay, I think this is going to take off. Maybe I want to go talk to some of these people here and see if I can uh, build this thing up and see what kind of potential it has. Um, do some self-reflection and think about, you know, what do I need to make this successful? Maybe there's five things. And maybe you're good at two of them. Um, we, I'm sure we've all seen, we've all been pitched by entrepreneurs who come in and they are, I've got this. I've got the whole thing. There's zero risk here. I'm bulletproof, whatever. <laughs> That's horrible, don't do that. We all know that nobody's got everything. If you have, say, two out of the five things, that's awesome, you know. So let's say the others are, um, uh, I don't know how to raise money, um, I don't know how to build a team, or whatever. Look around for some people that do. You got some awesome resources right here of people that know how to get over some of that stuff. So if you can get to now where you got three of five things or four of five things, you're on your way. And so a lot of what um, I do, and I think all we do, all of us do, is when we'll look at an opportunity uh, that's pitched to us, we're not thinking so much about is it three million or is it 250,000 or whatever. It's what's missing from this deal. You know, we need some extra help in this area or this area. Are we the right people to help this person get from, from here to there? And I think, think of fundraising in terms of that. If you start to put together all those um, things that you're missing and you've got the right people around you, um, the funding will probably show up. And, and, and come along if, if you're talking to the right people. If so, you don't know who to talk to to start off with, lawyers are usually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's actually a good point. So, so let's say you have a, um, a founder, an entrepreneur, and there is some, some backup, some work that needs to be done. What do you do? How do you refer them? Let's say you have an example like that. How would you actually advise them? Somebody that comes to me. Um, well, we do, like, we have a good relationship. Um, so I will more often than not see a deal that's too early for us. And like I said before, that's fine. You know, I want to see what's going on. And unless it's something that I just know nothing about, like some biotech, whatever, um, I might refer you to somebody. Here's, I got another guy I know who does biotech. Go talk to them. Um, but if it is something that I, I know something about, I will refer them. I refer tons of stuff down here. Uh, this isn't a particularly good program. I'm not just saying that because they're sitting here. Um, probably refer more stuff here than I do to people in Richmond, frankly. Um, and that? then I'll, I'll keep track of it and kind of see how it moves through the system uh, like that. And so, you know, a year or so will pass. We'll see. We've got some that just came out of your program now that are working well. And, you know, I'm hoping that eventually they'll get to where I can work with them as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so, obviously, thank you for that. I do think we have a great relationship, and it's really important for you all to know that 
Um, depending on who you talk to, people say upstream, downstream. That always confuses me. So, um, but um, Scott and NRV and having venture capital and later stage funders is really important to propel growth on that strategic path. So making sure he's constantly checking in and looking in at our uh, at our portfolio companies is really important. Similarly. Um, I'm referring things down this way. So these folks are really important um, to 757 Angels and to 757 Seed because they fill critical parts of the journey for you. So I think relationships are really, really critical and it's important to know that we're growing those relationships here in Hampton Roads. And in the same way, I've got people that are sitting right here <laughs> that you know I talk to all the time in that, that same manner and they might be corporate partners, they might be right you know, just bigger venture capital funds and stuff. And I'll constantly make sure that they see what I'm doing. Um, you know, hey, so-and-so, you might be really interested in this one. I've got it right here. We think in a year might be ready for you. And make sure that they're paying attention to what I'm doing. I would say one of the things that the Accelerator has sort of captured a lot of the work that's been done before we were here, which is the mentorship network. Which there are, I mean, in, in year one, we had over 80 people sort of come out of the woodwork, some of whom we knew, and not out of the woodwork in terms of being in our world, but other people who have held up their hand and said, how can I help? And all these people want to lean in for fantastic entrepreneurs in this area because they believe in keeping entrepreneurs at the, at the center of what we're doing. They believe in the, the view that entrepreneurship and innovation is the future in this area. And they know that the community around, as, as I, I hope this group is giving you the feeling, the community around you is cheering for you. You just have to reach out, and that's one of the things that's tough about the entrepreneur personality is a lot of it is, I'm going to do this alone. I'm not going to ask questions. I got this. As these guys were describing, they get pitched to by a lot of people who have decided they just don't need any of this early stuff, and they're just ready. And again, these guys refer because we all, we all want all these ideas to succeed, and, and certainly it's Darwinian, and the best ones will rise to the fore, but that doesn't mean that there aren't great businesses out there. They may not be incredibly scalable, but as Monique was saying, we're, we're cheering for all of the entrepreneurs in this community because we need them all. But the mentors really are a place to go, and they may have a tiny thing that they can offer, just I know the best about business models or I'm fantastic at pitch decks, or it may be one of these guys who's either sat in a million investment meetings, made a lot of investment decisions, started a lot of companies, and they have a lot of sort of more of a global perspective to offer. So I would say that reaching out and sort of connecting with this group, as these guys are terrific mentors, but we can also connect you with other people um, that have either industry expertise, maybe a subject matter expertise, or a lot of startup experience. The thing I'll just point out is uh, you know, it can be very, very isolating to be an entrepreneur. And I think all of us at some point have been CTO, Chief Therapy Officer. You have to get out, you have to talk to people, you have to meet others who are in your position and have been there. So do not be isolated, get out in the community. Great, so uh, maybe that's a good segue. Let's do a sort of a, a little lightning round here with these amazing um, panelists. And if you could give one tip, one piece of advice people just don't know, what would it be? And you've done a little of it, but if there's some more that you can share, that would be great. Um, and I'm going to start with Scott, because he looks like he is full of advice. <laughs> uh, hmm. um, I started both of my companies by myself, and I would advise no one to ever do that. Um, in fact, um, the best teams that I see are usually two people, sometimes more, but usually two. Uh, the reason for that, at least the way that I look at it, is you have people that are kind of right brain dominant. They're fairly creative. They can come up with ideas and stuff like that. Um, but like me, they can't manage their way out of a paper bag. And then you have other people who are MBAs and stuff like that. And they are really good at making all the trains run on time and all that and getting everything organized. You know, good. They may be a chief operating officer. You're just partner partners or whatever. But those types of teams are great. And going back to your comment, I mean, um, uh, it's just a much healthier way to approach the whole thing. I mean, the stress is just crazy. So if you can bring in at least one other person, if not a few, it'll just make it infinitely more pleasurable. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have all kinds of little tips. Lots of uh, tips. <laughs> lot of little and give tips. them. Tip I agree with the, um, obviously, having some uh, 
teamwork makes the dream work, I always say. So, um, and definitely when you come to 757 Angels or 757 Seed, um, raising money is hard. It's really, really hard. So everybody needs to know that when they come in. And having a partner, having a teammate is really important for investors because there has to be someone executing on the business while the other person is meeting with the investors. So we need someone to mind the store. So at least two people, you can really cover a lot more ground So um, and, and share some of those challenges. Um, Warm introductions. I think um, we're all pummeled by tons of emails all the time. I do my best to get back to everybody. Um, I'm sorry if I've missed anything from anyone out there, but um, if there's a warm introduction, it's easier um, for me to get back to you. And if we do end up meeting, please don't tell me that you don't have any competition. So, um, <laughs> yeah, um, you have it. And if you don't have it, um, I might not be as interested. So really study your market and know your market. I don't want to know your market better than you. Yeah. So I would say this in the world of, of mentors and investors and the people that you see, I think what you guys are trying to do, if you are an entrepreneur, I, I absolutely admire the journey. But I would say just everyone you meet is a potential mentor, is a potential investor, is a potential teammate, is a potential customer. So be open, be a listener, be a question asker, inquire, um, and engage with the people around you because there's something in there in the places that you never expect it. So I think the isolation piece really shuts you down to that kind of openness. And I think if you come to events, I mean, you need to be running your business, but, but make it a priority at some point to check in and know that the people that you meet might fit any one of those sort of really critical buckets that you need later. Bob's the only guy who's old enough to remember this, but uh, <laughs> uh, there, there was a guy named John McKay who was a football coach for the NFL. He does remember. Yeah. <laughs> See, the NFL. For the so, University of Southern yeah. California. Well, but then he went to Tampa yeah. Bay. Like, he's in your space. He went, he went yeah. to Tampa Bay, who? and it was one of the worst teams ever. <laughs> and a reporter asked him, what do you think of your team's execution? He said, I'm all for it. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, my point in that, other than this thing, John, <laughs> Bob Smith, is uh, it really is about execution. And you have to go into this knowing that it is going to be a long, slow slog. You're going to have to pivot. You're going to have to change the way you do things. You're going to have to rethink some things. Just get used to the idea that it's not going to be easy. It probably won't kill you, particularly if you get some therapy. But it's just a long, slow slog and be ready for that. Well, I appreciate the USC plug. So, yeah. I always, um, so in the, uh, I will plug and say, you want tips? Come, we're doing a program down here in June yeah. for ICAP. You're so sick of tips by the end of it. I'm just like <laughs> all the war stories. But I would say one thing that the most entrepreneurs that I see um, think big, and you have to think big when you're an entrepreneur, right? You got you got to have an unrealistic sort of view of the world, or you wouldn't do this. You you'd get a night, you'd punch 30 years in some place and be very happy. Um, but there's a difference between where you're dreaming. You have to dream big, but you have to think small. And the reason why I say that is, is like, you know, it's, uh, most of the companies that I've started or been a part of, I always tell them, have a lot of small successes rather than look for big ones. And, and, and also expect a lot of small failures. And one of the reasons why I got into teaching lean startup was that um, it was the one thing that made sense. Um, and it, you could tell it was written by an entrepreneur. Because it, 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 the assumptions that you're probably wrong more often than not, um, and, if you, and th if you think about it, if you make a very large assumption about the world and you go to try to prove that, it's very hard to prove. And if you're wrong, how do you move to the other assumptions? But if you make rather small assumptions and if you try to test those assumptions constantly and you iterate and you're in an iterative process while you're going through that slog, then the failures become successes because they start to train you to, to, um, and to pattern match on what's a good decision, what's a bad decision. And by continuing to get little small victories, uh, what you learn, you learn how to be a successful company. And um, that's what I always tell people. It's just like, it's, it's, you're, you know, it's a slog. You're going to be in it anyway. So make it so that every, you're, you're continually learning, not waiting six months to learn something. So I would just simply add one final thought, and my favorite one is 100% of nothing is nothing. <laughs> and I mean that in two ways. One is the team. 
literally, it's very, very tough to do everything on your own. The sooner you can, you can sort of find that, find common people who share your mission and really fill out the, the, the missing pieces. Scott suggested that, several of the panelists did. And the other relates when you're actually raising money. I mean, I've seen actually companies that are at a point where they, they truly do need to raise funds. Um, and they are not willing to relinquish appropriate ownership in their company because they're going to lose something. And again, it's just math, frankly. So just something to think about. Uh, we use that, that analogy all the time. You can own 100%, but it's nothing. It's not out in the world. Customers aren't using it. No one's experiencing it um, as you move along. So at this point, we would actually like to take Q&A from the audience. So I think what we're going to do is sort of raise the house lights up here a little bit. We have microphones coming, and we would actually like to be able to take some audience questions while we have our panelists. Hello, my name is Corey. Um, please be understanding to the fact that I don't know much about patent, trademark, and copywriting, but I, I understand the panelists to the far right stated that we should use our funding for um, maybe to build a team. And I wanted to know if we can use funding to build, to start a patent, trademark, or copyright. Yeah, I guess it depends on what you're doing. I mean, some stuff that's critically important. Um, where it's one of the first things that we'll look at is, you know, did you patent this stuff? Is somebody going to rip you off or whatever? Sometimes um, that's necessary. There's a, more often than not, it's not, you know, or you can get it later, or let's everybody just keep this a secret until we get a little further along and see how things work out. So it just depends. You know, early on, probably not going to have much money. So you just got to figure out what's important. If you talk to, you know, I mentioned talking to an attorney. Attorney's going to tell you to get a patent because they're going to charge a bill for it. So you got to make that decision on your own. <laughs> Hello, my name is Vanessa Hubbard and I designed the garage door, BBC. Um, and my question is, because I heard you mention, Scott, about um, doing it on your own. Well, fortunately for me, um, it was something that I was a passionate about, so therefore I didn't have any outsources, didn't know where to go. So I just took it upon myself to go look at, at some of the other um, uh, customer-based uh, businesses like Lowe's Home Depot, and of course, I didn't see what I wanted, but I knew what I wanted to see. I wanted to be special and I wanted to stand out. So if I'm trying to do my business by myself um, to the point where I've used a lot of my money, and as you would say about patent, it comes with hard labor because I took on two full-time jobs to come up with the money for this. So I'm at the point where it is patent, and now I'm trying to find um, how can I get it out there to the market, and what's my next step? Because I don't know how to do the rest of this. I'm unfamiliar to the platform, but I'm willing to get it out there and do what I need to do. So uh, let me understand, because it was a little hard to hear. But so you, you, you've, done so, you've made something. Yes. And now you're trying to figure out how to get it into the market. Yes, sir. Who do you think is the best first user of that product? The contractors or the builders. And contractor in what kind of contract? Like regular home builders? Or? Yes, home builders. Okay. Is it a large contractor or a small contractor? It could be either. Because everybody, I, when I first did it, initially I thought about every, people that own homes, most of them have garage doors. Um, in a military facet, you got uh, military housing. Most of them have garage doors. Um, and we're talking about national and international. So, so, well, I, and, and that, that's where the, the big planning is. The, what I was trying to do was say, like, if you, if you want to first start testing it in the market, what I, what, if you came to my program, mm -hmm. I'd say, well, let's go out and talk to some of those folks, and we'll break them up into little groups. And I always try to, like, um, if, if, I, the, the way I always look at it for somebody that's going out and selling, like, uh, or trying to get something into the market is, um, like, when you buy, go for a hotel on, uh, or when you buy a used car, right? Mm -hmm. You start out and you say you want an SUV, and that's like this. Right. But the more filters I put on that, I ultimately come down to my little Ford Escape that's sitting over in the parking garage, right? And it's the same thing with customers. Yes. And what I would challenge you to do is say, well, who's it best for? And, and like, who, who, who do you want to bet on? And what I would do is I would say, let's, let's go try it out with them. Okay. And if it's tangible and it's ready to be sold, I would try to sell it to them at a premium price. Okay. And, and very small, though. Don't, don't spend money doing this. 
the, there's a misconception that there's some magic pixie dust that comes down called marketing. That's twice I've heard that. And that's, I'm a, <laughs> I am a marketer by trade. That's what I do. I do, I do BD, I do marketing strategies and things like that when I used to work for real companies. Okay. There's, the, the magic is in understanding the person and finding out how to do that basic transaction. So I would tell you, I would tell you just make some little tests and then try to replicate those tests okay. and then start scaling the tests maybe with mail, maybe with another channel. And that's, that's the way you do it. Okay. Thank but you, you can, but just don't spend much money doing it. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Tasha Singleton, and I'd like for one of you all to define what you mean by validating a business. Because you've said it before, and I've heard it, but I haven't gotten the specifics on exactly what people are mean when they say validation. You, I need you to validate your business first. And it seems like people have different meanings. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the wrong. I'll, I'll start on my end. It's probably going to be a different answer for each one of them. We have, like, for me, I have certain filters because, you know, I've got investors too. I've got 82 investors who gave me some of their life savings to invest in you guys, whatever. And so I've told them, okay, here's the kind of things that we're going to do. And that was based basically on what I thought I was good at doing and what were guardrails for me in terms of me being able to invest. And so um, one of the things, for instance, that is a big gating item is we would like to have companies that have what we would loosely call market traction. So traction might be that you've got X millions of dollars of revenue or you've got three super well-known customers that are big companies or I don't know what it might be. But it was basically based on the fact that for us, we didn't want to take on a company that all of a sudden we got a year into and it's like, whoops, this was the wrong plan. Let's reboot and pivot and do stuff like that. And it's really just because me and my partners aren't really built to do that very well. We're not graceful people, I guess. Um, and so for me, the gating item has to be like, okay, we're real sure that we're going in the right direction. But that might not be true for the rest of everybody. Yeah. What I'd add to that is, yeah, at the stage that I typically work and Bob's probably the same, yeah, people come to us and say, we believe this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. What I want to hear is give me evidence that this will happen, that that will happen. And if you can do that, whether it's customers or the technology or the market or the partnerships or whatever it is, that sounds like a validating set of principles to me. If you can't tell me that this will happen because, you know, magic fairy dust will arrive, <laughs> that's not going to work so well. There's one other thing um, that, so I agree with everything that's been said, but attracting key, key talent to your team is validation. Um, so if you can attract really talented people to work with you, um, for our group, that actually means that you've rounded out your team and that there is a there there. Um, so I would just offer that yeah. as, a, as another validating point. But I would say it's validating your hypothesis. So in this lady's example, you know, she's going to go after, I'm going to, a small contractor, and she's able to do that. And they've been able to, they tell her that it's going to cost her this much, and then all of a sudden now she has a partnership with a big home builder. That's validation that she's on to something. And by the way, selling something to your brother or, or getting money from Good Uncle point. Charlie, yeah. that's not validation. <laughs> so I, I, will, I, I, will teach you, I will teach you the basics of, of how to validate because that's what I teach is how to, how to validate in that very beginning stage. So uh, do you want this? No, I really don't. What did I learn? So basically you're saying... I didn't learn anything. I just learned he didn't want this. Yeah. I don't know why he didn't want it. I, I've been drinking from it, so uh, we're friends. We're but but yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that either of us want to go there. And, and what happens a lot of times when you have an idea, people will go, oh, I talked to people and they loved it. Well, first, usually they talk to mom. Yeah. And if you can sell, selling to mom is not a proof point. But I challenge you, I always tell, challenge yourself. And this goes for all the people who worry about NDAs too. Don't worry about it. If you're, tell, if you're telling people enough that you need an NDA, you're doing all this wrong. But if you sat down and say, um, so, would you ever get thirsty when you're on a panel? I do, as a matter of fact. How so, did you guess? I don't know. You know, with all those lights and then you're talking. Um, so when you do that, what, what do you tend to do? I hope that Mallory or somebody out there will bring me some. Well, oh, wait, I have one. Oh. What a great idea. Well, so now I figured I out could use another one. that he had the problem <laughs> that I perceived he might have. And he can tell me how he answers it. 
And so what, what you should do in, in validating these things is start with your hypothesis and then make them prove it to you. Don't sell them on, you know, on validating you. And, and if you do that, at my stage, that's what I teach you to do. As you go up, you heard all, as your company matures and as the business model takes shape, you have to satisfy all of these validation points. And you never stop, by the way. And, and you're right that it does have different definitions for people at different stages, which is why I think this is so valuable to hear from all these folks. But it, it becomes traction later, which is validation earlier. But it's something along the lines, depending on who you're talking to, that you have a product that someone wants to buy at a price that makes sense to them that you can replicate several times over and then it can uh, you know, take a piece of a market that these guys would ever believe is big enough to get them the return they need and that you can capture that. That's team, that's execution, that's the fact that there's a big enough market. But that stuff sort of comes later. At the beginning, the idea as it takes shape and becomes a business, you're really after being able to get to the place where you have a value proposition that a customer will understand, you sell it at a price they're willing to pay for it, and you can do it over and over. And by the way, that doesn't change scale, scaled venture investment to cupcake business. Yeah. It doesn't change. Mm -hmm. we, I, I've done programs for people that are doing food trucks or, or just trying to come up with food. And we say, well, go, ask, go talk to people and try to figure out like, what they're looking for. And they're, well, it's a cupcake. So I go, well, sure, but you know, I mean, I'd be testing whether or not people wanted cupcakes before I'd invest in the cupcake. So no matter what it is, it doesn't matter what it is, you should validate with, with the market and see if the market responds and see if you can, at very low cost and very low risk, prove the point. And then usually somebody's going to give you money. So basically, we're just talking sales and revenues and... Yeah, but sale, remember, I, I, I had somebody come to me one time and, and they were in my program and he goes, don't worry, I don't need the program anymore, I made a sale. Oh. And, I, and I said, why? <laughs> and he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, why did you make the sale? And he goes, well, I brought it in and they bought it. And I go, no, 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 that's not why you made the sale. You couldn't prove, you couldn't, you don't know why you could do that every time. So it's not that can you make the sale, it's that you know why you make the sale. And that's the key. And that's you can keep doing it. And do it over and, <laughs> and over. And do it over and over. And do it over and over. Five times, a hundred times, a thousand times. Yeah. And at each of those different levels, there's going to be different problems that crop up. And right. that's really how you scale, how you solve the problems at each stage of the game. Yeah. And once you can prove that, you get a lot more validation from a lot more people. <laughs> the good validation, yeah. not the hard validation. Right. Yeah. So on that note, we are actually up against our time, and um, I first of all just want to thank all of our panelists for this really amazing <laughs> panel. Um, just to close, we are, we're also the last panel of the day for the IE series on Granby. And um, again, I want to just encourage everybody to continue to look for more events. This series is going to continue. This is really a collaboration of a number of organizations many of whom are, are represented here on this slide, and I just want to extend a sincere thank you, and it has been great working with all of you. This has been an amazing effort, and um, I think, again, there's going to be a lot more to come in our region with these organizations and certainly many more that will join us. Two other thank yous very quickly. I, I really want to give a huge shout out to local entrepreneurs Mark and Vanessa Lane. Yes, from View It, Do It. They have done all of the video videography here for the entire event, and it's really been awesome, and we really want to thank you for that. Um, Start Wheel, by the way, will have all of that video available. For those of you who want to see it, you can continue to follow them on Facebook and LinkedIn. So uh, with that, I want to thank you very much, and again, feel free to call on any of us in the panel if we can give you any advice in your entrepreneurial journey. So thank you so much. <laughs>